and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Millicent Walker. It is day 17 of Russia's assault and explosions have been heard in Kyiv as Russian forces encroach on the Ukrainian capital with intensified fighting to the northeast and the eastern part of the country. A number of major cities are under pressure as Russian strikes hit civilian structures. Ukrainians remain defiant, with several hundreds protesting in Melitopol against the arrest of the city's mayor by Russian forces. Fresh attempts to evacuate civilians from cities under siege in Ukraine are also being complicated by constant Russian shelling. Let's take a look at the key developments so far from day 17 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Fighting northwest of Kyiv continues as cities of Kharkiv, Chernihiv, Sumy and Mariupol are encircled by Russian troops. According to reports, Russian ground forces are 25 kilometers from the center of the Ukrainian capital. Rocket attacks destroyed a Ukrainian airbase and hit an ammunition depot in the Kyiv region. Sirens and explosions have also been heard in many cities across the country. Officials in Ukraine's second city of Kharkiv say at least one person was killed after residential buildings were hit by shelling. Ukrainian officials say Russia has again prevented civilian evacuations. Plans have been made to open up humanitarian corridors and get people out from cities under Russian attack including Mariupol, where conditions are said to be critical. Authorities say that more than 1,500 people have been killed there, and those who are left face freezing temperatures. The city currently experiences limited to no power and little food and water. <laughs> Meanwhile, hundreds of residents have taken to the streets of the southeastern city of Melitopol, to protest against the abduction of its mayor by Russian forces. In his latest video address, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky demanded the mayor's release. He also revealed that 1,300 Ukrainian troops have died in the conflict so far and says Russia is sending new forces to Ukraine after suffering what Zelensky describes as Moscow's biggest losses in decades. I know that my colleagues, you know, the, Prime the UK has sent six more plane loads of medical aid and equipment to Ukraine as Health Secretary Sajid Javid accuses Russia of war crimes in attacking medical facilities. Uh, this is a war started by Russia, completely unprovoked, completely unjustified, and what we are seeing from Russia especially the attacks on health facilities where the WHO have reported over I think 25 health facilities including hospitals have been targeted or uh, uh, hit for whatever reason completely unacceptable reasons uh, by Russian forces I mean this is a war crime and Russia will pay for the crimes that it is carrying out in Ukraine today The leaders of France and Germany have again held another round of phone talks with Russia's President Vladimir Putin. They called on the Russian president to declare an immediate ceasefire. The French president's office said after the meeting that Russian President Vladimir Putin showed no willingness to end the war. The conflict has now sent 2.5 million Ukrainians fleeing to neighboring countries. Then the situation really, I can't speak without uh, tears. I'm sorry, but I'm really sorry for my country. And nobody could expect this, really. This is awfully awful things. They're bombing Kharkov, they're bombing Nikolaev. It's only 120 kilometers from Odessa, and it's painful inside. Poland says more than 1.6 million people have fled there while Moldova says it has reached a breaking point in its ability to cope with refugees. <laughs> Meanwhile, for another weekend, thousands have taken to the streets to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine. An Italian police have seized a super yacht from Russian billionaire 
Andriy Melnichenko, a few days after the businessman was placed on an EU sanctions list following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As Russian forces surround the city with troops and artillery just kilometers away, Ukraine's civilian fighters and residents in the capital are preparing for a major attack. Arid sirens have rang out across the capital region as rocket barrages sent residents running for shelter. Well, joining us now is Mr. John Essing, a lawyer and an international expert in counterterrorism and conflict resolution. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me, Kadim. Good evening. This invasion has been going on for over two weeks now. The White House calls the Russian president's actions an escalation without an end game. Um, is this the case? What do you think Russia's motive and end game is here? There's, there's certainly an end game, and Putin knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, and there's always been one end game from uh, after, the first, after the Second World War in 1948. The West uh, established a rules-based international order, driven especially by the United States. And uh, what Russia is trying to do is substitute that rules-based order for an alternative, an alternative that to its totalitarian, totalitarian repressive uh, uh, order to form a new world order. So this is just a foundation to build up to that, so that if that order can be substituted for what is for what has been driving international relations for the last 80 years. That's the same thing that China is trying to do, and to a lesser, a lesser extent, uh, North Korea and uh, Iran. But when Russia was asked um, if it would go beyond Ukraine uh, during a meeting, I believe in Antalya, um, the foreign minister, minister said that no, um, but they've always said the reason why they are invading Ukraine, and, and that is about uh, the special operation denazifying and demilitarizing uh, the country. Yeah, I do, I, I've heard that as well, but that's just an excuse. Uh, Russia's intentions have never changed since 1948, and they wouldn't change. The, the rules-based order is democratic. It's, uh, it's secular liberalism, so it doesn't suit any authoritarian uh, repressive regime like, uh, like, uh, like Russia. So what it's trying to do is leverage its power regionally because that's where it has a bit of leverage. It wants to co-opt some of the satellite states that belong to the four USSR. When it has enough power in the region, then it'll, it'll posture itself on the international stage to see if it can compete uh, with uh, the United States and China. Because remember, it's, it's one of the tripartite that make up the uh, great power uh, co competition. The other countries are China and uh, and the U.S. And despite Russia being in that bracket, it's far below the par compared to the U.S. and uh, and uh, China. So this is its own. Um, this is the background to put him to put it at the highest level, so he can compete with those two powers. So the idea has always been to recreate the Russian Empire, the former mother Russia, so he can compete with the with the other two great powers. There's been talks recently about chemical weapons. Yesterday, that was the focus of the UN Security Council meeting, where on the one hand, we saw Russia accusing the US of biological weapons activities, and the US in turn saying the claims are a false flag uh, to justify Russia's potential use of similar weapons against Ukraine. What do you make of this? Yeah, that, it, it looks like a, a false flag, of, and it's a, it's a page straight out of uh, Russia's uh, playbook. But I don't think it'll get to a point where Russia deploys uh, 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 chemical weapons because you can't silo those kinds of the effect from those kinds of deployments. You can't, it's not sterile. And because you have many NATO countries in proximity to Ukraine, if it does that and there's an accident or a mistake where one of the NATO parts becomes, uh, NATO countries becomes a victim, then that legitimizes uh, NATO uh, under Article 5 to, to uh, confront, to get into confrontation with Russia directly. And Russia has been doing everything to avoid that. Despite its rhetoric, doesn't want NATO in the war. So it'll do everything to avoid that. So what the, the rhetoric is because for two reasons. One, it wants to, it's as a deterrence to keep the West out of the war. And uh, secondly, it's a, it's a uniquely created uh, narrative 
for its uh, constituents back at, in Russia because they've been fed this information. They don't actually know what's going on in Ukraine, but when that is uh, eventually unraveled, he'll lose a lot of uh, uh, political capital domestically like he's lost internationally. So that narrative is to feed his uh, constituents back home and to deter uh, NATO from uh, getting involved any further than it already has in Ukraine. Last week, the, the threat was over nuclear weapons. Some have said this war isn't going according to um, Russia's president's plan and is getting desperate. Um, do you agree with this? And is there a possibility of, of it deploying nuclear weapons? He is suddenly getting desperate uh, because the rules of engagement he initially deployed to 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 invade Ukraine were the wrong ones. He should never have done that. But they worked in Georgia in 2008. They worked in, uh, in the Donbass region in 2014. And they've worked in northern Syria for about 10 years. So he just thought, if it's worked in the past, I might as well deploy it. But there are different rules of engagement for asymmetric warfare than they are for conventional warfare. And despite Russia being having overwhelming superior uh, conventional capabilities it's not been able to make that much very much gains in in uh, ukraine because he needed to deploy a different uh, set of rules of engagement so he's desperate but he ca i don't think for the same reasons i made uh, con with new, uh, chemical weapons i don't think he'll de deploy nuclear weapons because that'll be too dangerous and it'll reach a tipping point so that will be the catalyst for nato to join the to, to join the war and he wants to do everything to keep NATO out of it because if he's struggling just with Ukraine that's why the support from from NATO if NATO joins it that will finish him so I, I don't think that's the case. If Russia takes control of the whole of Ukraine what would be the implications and perhaps the likely response from NATO and the US? To begin with I don't think Russia will ever be able to take uh, all of Ukraine because his forces are, its forces are strict at the moment. It doesn't have enough manpower to do that. It doesn't have enough equipment either. If it's going to do that, it has to deploy from Russia and it, it hasn't got the time to do that. But let's assume it did. Then I don't think that will compel NATO to join the, the, the war because Ukraine is doing very well as it is, and it would have done better if it had a lot more proximity to, to, uh, to, uh, to Russian forces. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to say something that might sound ironical. I think for Ukraine to win this war, it'll have to go, it'll have to allow uh, Russia to invade it so, so, it, so it, Russia becomes, Russia is quite close and there's enough proximity between the forces. Because this is basically asymmetry warfare. This is hybridized insurgency. And the closer Russia gets to Ukraine, the, the higher the chances of it losing the war. It may win the battle by invading Ukraine, but it'll certainly lose the war because it doesn't have what it takes to, to win it. And of course, um, NATO's posture, this is despite Ukrainian's president's uh, call for uh, declaration of a no-fly zone. That will definitely not be happening. Um, but tell us your thoughts about NATO's angle of diplomatic solution. NATO doesn't have, you can't negotiate with a revisionist like Russia. This has been an end game from 1948 and it's never going to change. Putin might not succeed with it, but he'll lay the foundation for the next for the next leader because he's about, I think he's 69 or 70, so he's on his way out. He knows that, but he wants to leave a legacy for at least leaving a foundation, so whoever comes in can take off from where he he stops. Russia understands the Anglo-Saxon mindset, the Western mindset. Westerners tend to see international agreement as a, as a, a mercantile uh, transactions with uh, enforcement mechanisms like your sales contract, the, you know, the basic contract. But the Russians don't see, they never see agreements that way. That's why we've seen lots of broken agreements going back, you know, uh, uh, going back many years, maybe 80 years. 
Yeah, several years, long before now. Lots of broken agreements because they understand the mindset of the West. If they agree, if, if Russia ever engages in anything to discuss an agreement or negotiate an agreement, it's to buy time for an agenda or it's to retune it to frustrate the agreement so that you never get to the objective it was meant to achieve in the, in the first place. So if the West is engaging in an agreement, it should have that in mind and buy time to look for alternatives as well, just like Russia. But Russia does not have any intentions of keeping any agreement. Even when it negotiates for an agreement, it's to buy it time so it can, like what happened a few days ago, it, um, it called for uh, negotiations with, with uh, uh, Ukraine so they could open a corridor, a humanitarian corridor for, for, to get the civilians out. But it started bombing the corridor while that, uh, uh, that, while that was still in force. So that just demonstrates what its intention was in the first place. It never keeps an agreement and is not going to be keeping one now. So you think that all the negotiations that are ongoing um, will amount to nothing? It's a complete waste of time. And I think that even those of some of the Westerners negotiating know that because this has been, that is how Russia is. If Russia never, if it ever keeps an agreement, it's on its own terms. And Ukraine will rather die than, than, you know, exchange a piece of their real estate for Russia. They, they, they wouldn't, they, it wouldn't work. Tell us, paint a picture of what you think the future is, because um, it's almost like you're painting a very bleak uh, picture, most especially for Ukrainians who are really at the receiving end of this war. I think what we'll have is a, an intractable, protracted, long-term war. Russia is going to win the battle when it gets in, into, as it gets into Ukraine. But the war will begin the day Russia invades Ukraine because that will transition for Russia from being a conventional warfare to Ukraine to being uh, uh, a asymmetry or, or hybridized uh, insurgency where you don't need the power of Russia to win the war. What Russia should have done to begin with is ask basic questions. Who is my enemy? What are their tactics and strategies? Where is the arena of contestation? How, how equipped am I? How, how adept am I to that terrain? And what do I do for what constitutes success? Do I degrade their capabilities to contain them? Or do I go for broke and, and go for a decisive victory? That's what they went for. They went for the latter and the failed. So that's why what I said. That's why I said what I said in the beginning. When there is more proximity between uh, the the Russian troops and the Ukrainian troops, the Ukrainians will have a, a, a better opportunity to win the to win the war. Uh, what, but that can only happen when uh, Russia invades Ukraine. And from that end, if Ukraine wins the war, what happens? If it wins the war, it kicks Russia out. Russia will lose all credibility. It'll lose all of its political leverage. It'll lose all of its economic uh, capital. It's already doing that, and with the world backing, uh, with the world backing Ukraine, uh, it'll be the end of Russia as we know it. But that is going to take a lot of time, and it is. Uh, I must say this. I must stress this. It is going to cost a lot of Ukrainian lives, unfortunately. Extremely unfortunate. I well, would like, like to thank you. Appreciate uh, you spending time with us on the program and your expertise. Mr. John Essien is a lawyer, international expert in counterterrorism and conflict resolution. Many thanks for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. As the war escalates, about 23 Nigerian students at Kherson State Maritime Academy are calling for help from the federal government to urge Russian authorities to declare a ceasefire in the city so they can be safely evacuated. The port city of Kherson in southern Ukraine has been under occupation by Russian troops since the first days of the war. The Nigerian students say they have spent about 15 days sleeping in bomb basements as Russia's offensive continues. According to them, many are unwell amid freezing temperatures and they are unable to get access to medicines and food is running low. Since this place has been captured, Nobody's doing anything to evacuate us from here. 
please, we want to go home. Everybody is cold. If we are in a normal life, we have eaters in our home. But in case of war, we are stuck on the ground where there is no eater. Please, talk to the mayor of Kherson. Talk to the people of Russia. Let them come in agreement so that there will be ceasefire for us to get a green corridor. Please, I plead with you. We don't have provisions anymore. Me and some couple of guys are stuck in Kherson, in Ukraine. And um, we, are, we are like about six that are not feeling fine, currently not feeling fine because of the weather. And um, there's no food actually to eat right now. Everything is just, we are in a critical condition. So we're calling on the Nigerian government to at least come to a rescue because the situation in Kherson right now, it's really crazy. An SOS there from Nigerians, Nigerian students who are in Kherson. Well, as with the rest of the world, Russia's invasion of Ukraine February 24 is casting a long shadow across Africa. Despite the geographical distance, there are important ties between Ukraine and Africa, including more than 8,000 Moroccans and 4,000 Nigerians studying in Ukraine and over $4 billion in exports from Ukraine to Africa. As Russia's invasion of Ukraine escalates, the Moscow's growing influence in Africa has led to different responses among the continent's leaders. Heads of state from around the world, including many from Africa, have lambasted the Russian attack with a number of African countries voting in favor of a UN resolution condemning Russia's offensive. However, a number of countries have been publicly reluctant to denounce Moscow. One of them is South Africa. President Cyril Ramaphosa said on Friday that he has been asked to help mediate peace between Russia and Ukraine after having spoken to his counterparts, Vladimir Putin. But some analysts are questioning whether South Africa's ties to Russia could impact its neutrality. Well, for more on this, we're being joined by security and global affairs analyst, Confidence McCarry. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me once again. Confidence, before we get on with uh, Africa's position, I'd like to get your thoughts on the kind of situation um, you just heard from. And this is uh, Kirsten, the Nigerian students who are in Kirsten and who are calling for the federal government's help. Yeah, well, it, it's very sad that uh, more than two weeks after the war started, we still haven't gotten our students out. Uh, I, I, saw, I saw an update on Twitter the other day when uh, there was an announcement that the APC uh, plane movement to rescue the students then returned empty handed after uh, the first and second batches of, batches of students were rescued. And it, it's, yes, I understand the fact that getting to a green corridor to, to get students out has been quite difficult because of the violation of ceasefire between the Russians and the Ukrainians. But it is very sad that after the last uh, mission which APC went and came back. There's not been any word from the Nigerian government as, as regards the rescue of students. While countries like India, China, and several other countries are still on the are still trying to rescue their own students. So, so it's very, very sad that it is not a, it, it, it is not a welcoming development. Especially for those in Kherson where Russia is controlling at the moment. Um, but let's come back to talking about the continent. Uh, were you surprised about the statement from South African leader saying that his country has been asked to mediate in this war? No, it, it's not entirely a surprise. South Africa is a member of uh, BRICS. Um, BRICS is uh, a collection of countries, economically aligned countries such as Brazil. Um, Russia, South Africa, and uh, uh, I think, uh, I, I don't really, really remember the other countries that are part of it, Ext extensive, uh, extensive amount of ties with Russia. So uh, it, it's super interesting. And first of all, you could see it from the, from the event that uh, the more many countries are, are less willing to outrightly condemn Russia's actions, the more Russia has been open and willing to communicate with them. You know, so you, you are seeing the same thing with people in uh, with countries like South Africa, with with Turkey, with Israel, and the rest of them. Uh, Russia's decision to hold mediation in Minsk, in Belarus, has not gone down well with the Ukrainians. So even the Turkish experiment.
it has largely failed. And so Russia has been open to other ideas, such as Israel and South Africa. So it's not entirely shocking, it's not entirely surprising that South Africa is actually trying to take the place of the mediator in this conflict. I mean, it, it's, if, if, if possible, we should welcome such decision. Also, the, the refusal by some African countries to condemn this war has generated some criticism. Some analysts have raised issues of territorial integrity, tying Russia's invasion of Ukraine to um, colonial domination of African states. Do you think that this puts countries like South Africa, uh, who abstained from the UN votes, on the wrong side of history? No, actually not. I mean, Africa's interest in this conflict is simply economic. And the, it, it is better for us to channel our direction, our energy to where it actually favors us more than to go on a spurious amount of condemnation, which does not go well for any of the parties. Uh, for people saying, for people tying this thing to colonialism, they're not entirely wrong. There are arguments that Russia has not colonized or invaded any country in Africa, and we're even instrumental to decolonization efforts by the countries in the by the continent independence leader, leaders. So, so there is merit to those arguments, but we're living in vastly different times now. All business, all, all relations between many of these countries have moved away from the moral and ideologic, uh, idealistic part into, into a business and, the, should I say, a real political kind of uh, environment where other countries are looking out for their interests. And so for the majority of the countries who abstain from the condemnation of Russia in, this, in the United Nations General Assembly last week, they have valuable reasons for doing so. But I, I take exception to actions from countries like Nigeria and Kenya who voted to condemn. They could take a leaf from a country like South Africa, who initially condemned Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine, but initially, initially, then, then chose to walk a fine line back to suing for peace and choosing to abstain from United Nations uh, General uh, Assembly votes. Uh, but for Africa, this, this is a conflict, this is a war that is happening thousands and thousands of miles away from its territory. So the best we could do is to curate its interests, to look out for its interest in the conflict and make sure that uh, it is not taking sides in, in whatever way. How do you think Nigeria's role uh, and that decision at the UN um, Council, how do you think it, it affects us? Well, uh, we should look at it from Nigeria's ties with, with Russia. Uh, of, of course, certainly it does not all go well for, for, for the two countries. Nigeria and Russia signed uh, a, couple of, a couple of defense agreements uh, during the Russia-Africa summit in Sochi in 2019. There were a couple of other ones that were supposed to be signed during the second Russia-Africa summit towards the end of the year. And so it, 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 uh, it, it, barely, makes, it barely makes sense uh, you know, for, 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 such, for such an agreement. But and on the other hand, you could, also look at, you could also look at what Nigeria stands to benefit in this conflict. Uh, since the war, we have seen energy shortages in Europe. Russia was the number one gas supplier to uh, many countries in Western Europe. They had the North Stream 1 project, and then we currently have the Nord Stream 2 project, which supplies gas directly from Russia to Germany, which has now been suspended uh, because of the war as part of sanctions to, to influence Russia's uh, actions to pull out. But Nigeria currently has uh, an agreement which is signed with Niger, Niger Republic and Algeria to, to ship liquefied natural gas, uh, the Trans-Saharan pipeline to Europe. Nigeria is already supplying some European countries with liquefied natural gas. And so it's, it, they, to some extent, you could say that it has an influence yeah, in condemning, in, 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 in seeing that the war stays the worst is uh, continues for as long as it can. But it, it, the, the bizarre nature in which he went ahead to condemn Russia is quite, I mean, it's quite inconsistent with some of its gains that, that are supposed to be made, especially in seeing that the conflict continues so that Nigeria is going to earn, uh, is Nigeria is going to get more revenue from its, uh, from its uh, a gas exports to Europe. Uh, all, all on, on the surface, it doesn't look well, it doesn't look good, it doesn't go well for Nigeria's relations with Russia. Uh, I, I do hope, I do hope that uh, policymakers at the Nigerian Foreign Foreign Mission and uh, Nigerian Ministry of Foreign Affairs actually know what exactly they are doing and why they actually have to take such a, a bizarre stance. Mm. But also, uh, as the war rages, another issue that has been raised by Western leaders is the presence of Russian mercenaries, uh, Wagner Group in Africa. Do you think this is something we, sh we need to be worried about? Russian mercenaries have been in Africa long before the, the conflict in Ukraine broke out. But the Wagner Group were first spotted in places like Libya, where uh, Russia tried to get, gain, gain a foothold into the Mediterranean, trying to, in, as part of its, its uh, attempts to, to channel or to private power to the Middle East. And so Libya was the first testing ground for the Wagner Group. 
and then they expanded to places in hinterland Africa, such as Mozambique, and then the Central African Republic, which they were called in to stop the advance of the uh, Tisaleka and Atibalaka movements into the capital. You know, so currently they are in Mali, which, uh, of course, the, the government of uh, uh, Asimi Goeta called them in for, for protection and to rescue to, to help in counter-terrorism efforts. But we all know what, we all know why the Wagner group is in, is in Mali, for instance. It's, it's definitely not to protect the country from terrorists. It's, it's, it's basically the rules of regime, regime protection. There is, if, if, the, if the French military with Operation Backhand, Operation Takuba, and the might of several European powers could not dislodge uh, jihadist terrorists from Mali, there is hardly so much that uh, also little so that, that the Wagner group can do. But um, in the current context of the conflict, I think we should be a lot more weary if the conflict in Ukraine progresses so badly for the Russian government that its military cannot keep up with, uh, with, with its objectives and then it has to withdraw the Wagner group. And I hate to say this, if you withdraw the Wagner group from a country like Mali, which depends, whose government heavily depends on it for regime security, it, 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 it's kind of an opening to a Pandora box of a, a lot of competing interests, terror groups competing for, uh, uh, competing for control with the Malian military, as well as several other interest groups that might try to exploit the vacuum that has been created by the exit of the Wagner group, which, like I have said earlier, was called in to protect uh, the Malian regime. And so we might be looking at a full-blown insurgency in not just the hinterlands or the northern part of Mali, where the the Azawa, oh, sorry, the Suareg rebels have been operating since 2012, but right at the center of the Malian government itself in Bamako. So I, I think it's kind of an insurgency that, or it's kind of uh, a conflict rather that not only the Malian government cannot afford right now, but also the Nigerian government being uh, the, the regional huge money, the uh, economic uh, community of West African states of course. So quite, quite a, a tricky situation. Um, but looking at how everything is going, how would you say that African, African leaders or countries in Africa, uh, the governments, should respond to this conflict, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine? I, I think, I think in, in refrain from condemnation is necessary, yes. You could sue for peace, you could call the other parties to come to a negotiating table, but I, I will not kid you by saying that a negotiation is easy to come by. I mean, even uh, a, a president like uh, Emmanuel Macron of France, has, has been roundly condemned the past week for suggesting that a Finlandization of Ukraine is uh, on the table. I mean, the comment did not go down well in, in Ukraine, saying that uh, they want uh, uh, the same situation that happened with Finland at the onset of the Second World War to happen to Ukraine, where uh, its neutrality will not, is not entirely a neutral position, but subject to the whims and the caprices of the, the Soviet Union. And, and so I, I, I will not keep it to say that negotiation is easy. So far, the negotiations have not really gone well. Ceasefires have been agreed upon and violated at will, and good sides are choosing well, well, the other party for violating it. For Africa, our interests are very simple. The number one gambit is to get our students out. Uh, it's very heartbreaking seeing the video from Nigerian students talking person and some of that's in Sumi. Uh, so our priorities right now should be able to get our students out of harm's way. When you get them out of harm's way, then we try to we funnel our interests. What, what exactly are our interests in the conflict? If they're economic, if they're political, how exactly should we respond? Who figures us more? Are we going to keep following the West in, in their attempt to gather more international sympathy for uh, the anti Russian brigade, or we are going to tow the Russian line to it? If we're going to tow the Russian line, there are repercussions concerning state conflict and the encroachment of state territoriality and sovereignty. And these are issues that all countries in, on the continent must have to come, come to terms with. And uh, thankfully, we have uh, a channel like the African Union and several other regional positions that we can be able to educate this interest. But for me personally, I would say that uh, any form of condemnation on for both sides of the conflict is not entirely right. What we should be doing right now as a continent is to be condemning racist actions that have been attributed to Ukrainian and Polish border officials in their treatment of African, African refugees in their country. Yes, indeed. Security and Global Affairs Analyst Confidence Makari, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me once again. And more U.S. soldiers have been deployed to Europe. This is Friday now to assist NATO allies amid the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. Some 130 soldiers stationed at Fort Stewart in Georgia bombed fists with their leaders as they departed from 
Hunter Airfield, including Captain Sarah Seekins. Major General Charlie Costanza said the soldiers were told to prepare for a six-month mission. Costanza added that he felt proud watching the soldiers board the plane, but also understood that it wasn't easy for them to leave their families. The soldiers are from the B Company, 87th Division Sustainment Support Battalion, 3rd Division Sustainment Brigade. The U.S. Army said the soldiers' mission included reassuring NATO allies and deterring Russian aggression. Refugees from Ukraine sought shelter and help at temporary reception centers in Poland southeast today as governments and volunteers struggle to find shelter for nearly 2.6 million people who have fled Russia's invasion so far. Poland has received most of them, but hundreds of thousands have also crossed to EU member states like Slovakia, Hungary and Romania, as well as to non-EU Moldova in the past two weeks. Many arrivals are seeking to travel on elsewhere at a town a center in the town. A transportation offers were written on signs and people coming to help refugees were on the ground. Danish volunteer Hans Otto Sorensen said he had come the day before and was hoping to take up 100 people on a bus back to Denmark. Mohamed Salem, a Libyan man living in Kiev with his Ukrainian wife, said the situation in the capital. He hopes that the fighting would stop soon. Help the people who are in this big need, who are the victims of this uh, catastrophe which is going on in Ukraine. We feel it as our human responsibility to help them. And what we are doing is we are transporting them to Denmark, where we have accommodation for them, and they'll be allowed to stay as long as they want. And we will also see that they can get a job if they want and so on. So we are here completely as private people, left Denmark yesterday afternoon and has come here to pick up uh, around 100 people and bring them back to Denmark. It's a very bad feeling because uh, it's a very bad situation there and uh, all people want to go out uh, because uh, there is more bomb and there is bad situation for all people. Uh, I hope it's... Uh, will be uh, good if we think uh, soon but uh, serious it's very bad situation for people to stay uh, there staying with poland is economic minister says ukraine is facing a humanitarian crisis and urgently needs supplies of food and medicine to be brought into the country. Uh, Yulia Seridenko at a train station in Poland, one of the main ports of entry for people fleeing Russia's invasion, also called for tougher sanctions on Russia. Ukrainian officials said on Saturday heavy shelling and threats of Russian air attacks were endangering attempted evacuations of desperate civilians from encircled towns and cities elsewhere. Nearly 2.6 million, mostly women and children, have fled to neighboring countries. We are facing humanitarian crisis right now, so uh, that's why we are talking with the government and uh, with the government of EU and uh, we're asking for a help for a humanitarian aid that might go to Ukraine. That's why we're here, we're trying to build the, a proper uh, logistic route so to, to get it very quickly and to, to provide people with all necessary, with the water, with the food, with the medicine. So that's why we're also asking once again, if you have this opportunity to help Ukraine right now, uh, we need, first of all, it's top priority is, uh, I think that for food products, the second one is a medicine, of course, when weapon is another track and I don't want to discuss it right here. I think that uh, this sanction is not enough, it should be more. Uh, because, you know, every day our people, uh, they are dying, children dying. Uh, we have a humanitarian crisis in several cities. Uh, people lack of water, lack of food. And that's why just we, we actually, we have, you know, we don't have weeks or months. And that's why uh, we need this assistance right now. We need your help uh, today. And uh, we really appreciate if you can, uh, you know, make this sanction uh, more effective. Uh, for, against Russia. We're checking uh, the situation with our Ukrainian people that live country for the last two weeks and we would like to check the conditions here and we also uh, also would like to persuade people that uh, we are keeping fighting 
and we hope that we will win. And uh, for all these people here in, in, uh, in Poland, we would like to persuade them that they will have opportunity to return back home and we will make everything uh, to create conditions and to make uh, the full reconstruction of the country and to fight uh, against Russia. So. Ukraine's foreign minister says the country is ready to negotiate to end the war started by Russia more than two weeks ago, but would not surrender or accept any ultimatums. Speaking at a virtual event organized by the nonpartisan nonprofit organization Renew Democracy Initiative, Kuleba says civilian lives will be saved if Ukraine had fighter jets and more attack planes to destroy large military columns. He adds that he believes the war would likely end if Russian President Vladimir Putin were removed from power. This doesn't exclude the track of diplomacy and the need to talk and to find, find solutions, but uh, as President Zelensky said on a number of occasions, uh, we are ready to negotiate, but we are not going to accept any ultimatums and surrender. If we had uh, more planes, we would have been able to save many more human lives mainly civilian lives, because the main striking force of Russia is in the air. And they indiscriminately choose to attack house, you know, civilian infrastructure and kill our civilians. Uh, I believe that uh, the removal of President Putin will be enough to stop the war. But uh, the restoration of peace and security in the Euro-Atlantic space will also require not only the removal of Putin, but the deputinization of Russia. Putin is not uh, just uh, a person, it's a system. And uh, Russia has, must be deputinized. Since the invasion, Western countries have swiftly moved to isolate Russia from the global financial system. U.S. President Joe Biden opened a new attack on Russia's economy early on Friday, joining with allies to hit Moscow on trade and shut down development funds, announcing a ban on imports. The European Union announced it will ban the export of its luxury goods to Russia in order to deal a blow to the Russian elite. Taken in coordination with G7 countries, which includes the UK, the US, Canada and Japan, the package also includes denying Russia the status of most favoured nation in their respective markets. Russia has become the world's most sanctioned country, with over 5,000 sanctions so far. But is this enough to deter Russia? How much impact will these sanctions have? Well, joining us to discuss this is an international affairs expert, Mr. Paul Ejime, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me, Millicent. Welcome. Yesterday, U.S. President announced fresh sanctions, which includes revoking Russia's um, preferred trade status and pushing to suspend normal trade relations with the country. How significant is this move and, and what impact is it likely to have on Russia? Well, put all the sanctions put together, you have talked about them about 5,000, 5, and that makes uh, Russia, the mo in history, um, that is the most uh, sanctioned uh, nation. You will think that the idea is to squeeze and destroy the Russian economy. But is that the whole idea? The, the sanctions will also have um, effects across the world, not just in, in your, uh, the, the report that preceded this, your, uh, this interview. You had Poland complaining that uh, they were. They also needed help to be able to take the um, the amount of refugees that are now uh, flowing into that country. Other uh, neighboring countries are facing the same. It is not about sanctions. It, they are treating this uh, conflict as if it's about um, economy. Remember, they went there because Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, something that is political. But now they are using these economic um, uh, uh, factors, sanctions, to thinking that that alone will be able to um, make um, uh, uh, Putin to, um, uh, you know, what will Putin do? No, but much is not being talked about in, in terms of the, the um, uh, dialogue and negotiation. It's only the UN uh, Secretary General that is talking about it. 
sanctions will hurt not just uh, uh, Russians, for 145 million of them, it will hurt 43 million U uh, Ukrainians. It will also hurt millions of uh, neighboring countries, and even has it has a, they will have reverberative effect across the globe, even to Africa. You know, because they will now tell you the uh, amount of cooperation that Africans used to 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 have will be diminished. It will be reduced, and you see President Biden talking about now denying Russia the um, uh, preferential, you know, uh, free trade. Africa also has to watch it. Remember, we have mm -hmm. uh, the um, uh, AGAL, you know, African um, uh, Growth and um, Opportunity um, Act, which is uh, ending in 2025. If the, the, the Western world can wake up one morning and then begin to, without due process, begin to cut off countries, who tells you that they cannot use the same thing against Africa? So that is the reason this um, uh, unilateral, inconsistent, and then um, hypocritical kind of uh, sanctions are becoming too much. You cannot use um, the, the disease. Uh, the, the, I think the treatment is getting um, worse than the disease. I think they should now look at um, uh, uh, negotiation and how to bring them, um, because at the end of the day, even after killing everybody, you still have to come to the table. So why don't you do that now? We, we, hope, much... it, we, we hope it doesn't get to that. Uh, Putin has called the Western economic sanctions in Russia akin to a declaration of war. Um, but if sanctions are not enough, and if my earlier guest today is saying negotiations will not work, what then? I think sanctions alone will not either. It has to come with them. Uh, uh, Remember, this is same, uh, the same Western countries. Uh, history has a way of uh, throwing out uh, certain things. When it was uh, apartheid South Africa, remember uh, Britain under Thatcher told us that sanctions don't work. Uh, US uh, companies were doing business with uh, uh, South Africa then. Suddenly, they have uh, discovered that sanction alone can work. No, it can work. It has to go with, it has to be complemented by actions, certain actions. Uh, be, maybe behind the scenes, let countries engage those who can uh, that Putin, uh, Putin can listen to. They should be able to come together and bring them um, safe face. Now, rigidity cannot do it. We need some level of uh, flexibility. Uh, uh, Thank you so much, international affairs expert. Always a pleasure having you join us on the program, Mr. Paul Ejime. Many thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for having me. And before we go, let's take a look at the key events from today. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky tells a news conference that over a thousand Ukrainian troops have died in the conflict so far. He says that around 500 to 600 Russian troops surrendered to Ukrainian forces. And that was on Friday. A military airfield south of Kiev is hit by missiles, as reports suggest the bulk of Russian forces are just 25 kilometers from the city. French President Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz urged Russian President Vladimir Putin to agree to a ceasefire, uh, but uh, according to French office, he is not um, agreeing to that in terms of the body language. Uh, people in the city of Mariupol are set to be enduring freezing temperatures with no power and little food and water. Also, Russia has accused Ukraine of rejecting nearly all its offers to provide humanitarian corridors out of flashpoint towns and there you have it you've caught up on events key events on uh, day 17 uh, the russian invasion of ukraine that's our program this evening thank you for watching and melissa and stay safe.